All right, I'd like to just briefly uh, intro the next uh, genetic testing uh, panel. If you can uh, bring up the slides, thank you. Uh, so in multiple places, we've teased this UMDF genetic testing program. And uh, I think it's finally time to pull back the curtain and share with you some of the details. I'm really excited to be able to share some first details with you. We don't have everything today, uh, but uh, hopefully it will give you a sense of what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, first and foremost, we've heard over and over again throughout the panel discussions, throughout the presentations, through the Q&A, that we need more genetically confirmed mitochondrial disease patients in order to enroll them for the uh, uh, clinical trials that are underway and soon to be underway. And, and this issue is only going to get more dire as additional companies come into the space and want to develop uh, therapeutics for mitochondrial disease, which is a good thing. But we definitely need to try to drive more diagnoses. And it's not just about the clinical trials. Clinical trials are really important to you as a patient as well. Excuse me, uh, diagnosis, a genetic diagnosis is very important to you as a patient as well. That's how you access better clinical care. You understand the nature of your disease. As we continue to develop therapeutics, it positions you to be able to get the therapy that's right for you. Um, so this really isn't just about doing right by the uh, pharmaceutical companies. It's really about doing right by our, by our patient community. So at UMDF, we've heard this gap. We've uh, decided that this is something that's really important. And as we move forward with our mission, we want to launch a new program. We're calling the UMDF uh, Genetic Testing Program. It, it's a pilot program only because we're using it as an opportunity to, again, test uh, some um, approaches, if you will, to finding the, these patients. So um, uh, previously, I, I shared with you that with the launch of MitoShare very soon, uh, we will use that as the starting point. We want to have the patients engaged, understand that they're uh, coming into a registry where we can interact with them, engage with them, and then we can begin this process of beginning to uh, see if you're a good candidate for a no-cost uh, genetic test. Um, so many patients we know do not have access to the genetic testing, and that could be for, for a myriad of reasons. And we're going to address some of those in the upcoming panel. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But in, in this introduction, I just wanted to share how excited we are to be able to partner with, first and foremost, Zogenix, uh, who is providing the financial support for this pilot program, uh, to be able to drive a patient-facing, no-cost genetic testing program. Again, the details will come in the next month or so, uh, but you know, this really is a, a first of its kind for our community. And our hope is to try and drive as many diagnoses as possible, to move as many of you as possible along that diagnostic journey to having a confirmed genetic diagnosis of mitochondrial disease. I do wanna just briefly mention two other very important partners in, in this initiative, and that's GeneDx, the Diagnostic Testing Laboratory, who'll be performing the tests and probably genetic, perhaps a company you're not familiar with, uh, but that we're really excited to partner with to test out some of their methodology for being able to use the symptoms of the patients to try and identify those that are the best candidates to get genetic testing to confirm mitochondrial disease. So we'll talk about all that more in the upcoming panel discussion. With that, I'm going to turn it over to, to the video and we'll see you at the end. Hello everyone, and welcome to the genetic testing discussion panel. Uh, you just heard from me live about an exciting new program that UMDF will be launching later this summer uh, regarding a no cost genetic testing program. Um, as I said, we're really excited about the potential of it. And we thought it would be great to bring some of the principles together from that project in this discussion panel, plus hear from the patient perspective as well about the diagnostic journey and why genetic testing is so important to mitochondrial disease patients. So I'd like to quickly introduce uh, everyone that's joining me on the panel today. Uh, I'll start with uh, Doreen Casali. Uh, Doreen is a patient that's been diagnosed with TK2 deficiency, and she lives in California. Hi, Doreen. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're also joined by Elizabeth McCormick. She is a genetic counselor at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and she'll be by providing that perspective with the healthcare provider. Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Bill. We're also joined by Arnold Gamatoni, Vice President, Global Scientific Affairs and Medical Communications at Zogenics. 
So Genix is a pharmaceutical company based in California that is currently developing a therapy for TK2 deficiency. So welcome, Arnold. We look forward to your comments. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, we also have on the panel today, Sean Hoffer, who is the Executive Vice President and CLIA uh, Laboratory Director at GeneDx. GeneDx is a diagnostic testing laboratory based in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and Sean's going to give us the insights from the diagnostic testing perspective. Welcome, Sean. Glad to be here. Thanks. And then last, certainly not least, we're joined by Lucas Langa. He is the CEO of Probably Genetic. Probably Genetic is a genetic testing uh, company based in California that is targeting direct-to-consumer methodology and also helping pharmaceutical companies to enroll patients for their clinical trials. So welcome, Lucas. Great to be here. Thanks. Yeah, so let's get started, Doreen, with you, because I think the patient perspective is so critical um, that we first understand you know, what it means to be on the diagnostic journey. And, and my understanding is that for you, that was a, a protracted process over years uh, that ultimately resulted in a genetic diagnosis. Maybe you could just share with our audience briefly what that journey was like for you. Hi, um, again, I'm Doreen, and uh, I was diagnosed with a TK2-related mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome in 2015. Um, my journey started in 2013 when I had a fall where I injured my jaw, and um, I started feeling symptoms of weakness my facial muscles around my mouth and um, my eyelids. And um, I didn't really think too much of it back then. Um, I went to a TMJ specialist um, so he could take a look at the jaw and he gave me some um, something to wear at night uh, for that. But as months went by, I realized that um, my vision was changing and it felt like that my eyelids were starting to droop. So um, in October, around October of 2013, I went to see an ophthalmologist and he examined me and he suggested that I see a neurologist um, because he suspected that I might have maybe nice inia gravis. So I mm -hmm. um, made an appointment with a neurologist uh, here in San Francisco at CPNC. And uh, I went there, they did um, a lot of tests, blood tests, um, things for muscular dystrophy, ALS, MS, all of the tests, and all of them came back negative. And um, so I think the next step he said was maybe to get a biopsy. So I had to get a muscle biopsy. Mm. And uh, then the, the biopsy was st sent to Stanford University and then sent to Baylor for genetic testing. Um, after that, I got the results back of that, that they couldn't tell me a specific diagnosis. They said that it was just, all they could do was tell me it was general uh, mitochondrial disease. After that, um, I, um, I wanted to get more genetic testing done. So I called Stanford and, and asked them if I could come and do uh, some genetic testing, but they did not have enough of my muscle biopsy. So they had to do a needle biopsy. And this mm. was in 2014. Um, after the needle biopsy, they sent um, all of the, uh, they sent the assessment to Baylor and Houston. And uh, they did all the tests and um, still there was not an answer. Um, so I um, went to UCSF to see um, a neurologist there. And that's when um, he told me that he suspected that I had TK2 and um, that I, he, he gave me a different test and everything like that. After that, um, he said that, you know, he, he didn't have um, the test that I needed to take to confirm a TK2 diagnosis. So he recommended that I see uh, a neurologist, Dr. Hirano, at Columbia University in New York. So I went there and uh, he did a skin biopsy at the end of 2014. 
And then after that in 2015 is when I finally got my diagnosis. I think the whole time that I was going through all of these tests and, and just seeing different doctors, I saw four doctors in total and right. I had numerous genetic tests done. I think finally, when he told me in 2015 that I actually had TK2, it was, I guess, um, it was sad and happy a little bit because I finally found out what I had. Right. Half the problem in me wrapping my head around being sick was knowing what I had. So at least I knew what to research, what to fight for, what to look for. And so just getting a diagnosis was a, a big weight off my shoulders. Of course. Of course. Yeah. And then, uh, unfortunately, I think we hear so many aspects of your diagnostic journey that relates to what many others in our community experience in terms of seeing multiple doctors over multiple years, potential misdiagnoses, multiple biopsies, very invasive, um, uh, but very pleased that you, you were able to get to a diagnosis at the end of that journey. Um, and, and, and hopefully that does afford you some comfort in knowing what it is you're dealing with, but also there are other potential benefits around therapeutic development. And I think we want to spend some time talking about that with the, with the rest of the panel. Uh, Elizabeth, I'm going to and I turn to you. I, I, I'm sure you too. I saw you nodding. You know this story all too well. You interact with so many patients right in our community and know what it's like to have someone sitting in front of you looking for answers. Um, maybe just talk briefly, if you will, about the, you know, some of the challenges of diagnosing mitochondrial disease and where we're at in terms of uh, being able to diagnose our patients. Mm, sure. Yeah. So the challenges really do arise at every step of the genetic testing process, unfortunately. So for a lot of times for patients that maybe don't have a mitochondrial disease specialist, um, it can be tricky to find a doctor or another practitioner who uh, is able to order the test, who feels comfortable ordering a genetic test, but then also who's able to interpret the results that come back because it's not um, with every test that you get results and it's clear, you know, yes, this is the answer for your medical concerns. No, this isn't. So that's certainly um, some challenges that can come up. Um, and then once you're able to, um, you know, find someone able to order the test, well, now someone has to pay for it. Uh, these tests aren't cheap, unfortunately. Um, some insurance companies pay for genetic testing, some don't, some pay for a portion. So it's really uh, important to once you, uh, you know that genetic testing is indicated in you um, to really see if insurance will cover it. And then if insurance won't cover it, um, there's always the option to go to several different clinical labs. Because different clinical labs have different relationships with different insurance companies and are actually able to offer different financial assistant, uh, assistance plans, uh, payment options. So um, it's really worth to take that time to see what options are out there in getting the testing paid for and, and covered. But even with all the all these options, we know that there's there's still a large portion of our community that doesn't have access to genetic testing or don't, or don't have a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's that's not to say that they don't have a mitochondrial disease, right? That's something we always try to tell the patients that we see. Just because your genetic testing didn't give you the answer doesn't mean you don't have a mitochondrial disease. So that really does make it really important that you keep on this journey, even though it is very long or it, it can be very long, but it is worth it to really try to work to get that underlying genetic diagnosis for a couple of reasons. Number one, for the reason on everyone's mind is clinical trial eligibility, right? I think almost every clinical trial now, you really need that genetic diagnosis just so that drug companies can be sure that, you know, they're treating the patient population that they, they think they're, they're, they're treating. Um, but even more than that, it's really important to know what exactly is going on in someone's body and someone's cells that's causing their medical concerns, because that actually changes how the team treating you um, can think about you and think of different medicines that can help um, different specialists you might need to go see. And then from a genetic standpoint, the underlying genetic cause can have very different implications for other family members, the chances that they could be affected, the chances that a condition could be passed on to 
future children and future other other family members. So um, again, we understand it can be a long process, but um, hope it's something that can be continued on for most patients until they can get to that underlying genetic diagnosis. Yeah, really helpful. Uh, and it really frames the problem, you know, the challenge, but also why it's so important, right, to, you know, to, to get to this uh, the diagnosis. And it was really conversations like this over many years with many different stakeholders that, you know, encouraged us at UMDF to uh, think about ways in which we could help address this gap in our, in our disease community. Um, I've already had a chance to, to share with you that we're going to move forward with, the, with this program as a no-cost sponsored program. Um, I, I'd like to bring uh, you know, some of the partners you know, on, onto the conversation now, uh, really starting with um, uh, you, Arnold. Uh, you know, at Zogenix, uh, you, you very graciously approached us and said we, we would have interest in, in partnering with UMDF on, on, some, uh, on a program like this. You know, help us understand sort of where Zogenics is coming from, right? With uh, 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 helping to be involved in a project like this. Well, I think it's important for companies that are trying to develop new treatments to have um, confirmed genetic diagnoses in these patients because it helps us in a variety of ways from a development perspective. It helps us understand more about the conditions. What are the prevalence rates? You know, how do these patients present? What are their symptoms? what domains are most impacted in their daily lives? And, and how do they progress? Are there differences between younger patients or older patients? All of that information could be vitally important in helping us to design our trials. Which endpoints are we going to choose to put in our, in our studies? And what's the timing of those assessments based on how slow or how rapid these conditions progress? So I think first and foremost, it's just learning more and understanding because we could be sure, as was said earlier, that yes, these are patients with the condition that we're trying to study and get a new treatment approved for. I think the other important thing here, with, especially with rare and ultra rare conditions is just natural history. There's so little natural history um, on many of these conditions. And really to be able to a lot of times in a clinical trial have a good solid natural history because companies may use that as the comparator arm in their trials. Right. Um, and that becomes important because, you know, for example, in TK2D, we know that motor function is one of the major uh, domains that's impacted. Well, what are the patterns of progression? Is it, you know, kind of a, a linear process in terms of progression? Is it a stair-step process? Are there periods of spontaneous improvement? Um, that type of knowledge helps you understand it and be able to put into context what your treatment is doing because you know how naturally without intervention these uh, conditions present and progress. And then I think, and this was mentioned earlier, just being able to properly identify patients that can participate in our clinical trials because you have to prove to the regulators these are actually the patients that we're testing our treatment and that we say they are. Um, and having to rely on clinical presentation alone, when there could be so many overlapping symptoms with some of these mitochondrial diseases could be challenging. Um, TK2, for example, could present like Pompeii, it could present like SMA. Right. So there's a lot of overlap there. And, and really the genetic test as was mentioned earlier is critical in being able to say, yes, this is a person with this condition that could qualify for our clinical. Well, yeah, you know, I like to think of this as a, a true win-win. Many of the goals you stated uh, are shared by an organization like UMDF and that we have to better understand our patient population so we can provide mission and programs that are meaningful to, to, to all of these patients. Uh, so partnering on something like this is really an opportunity to you know, raise the greater good, if you will, of the entire mitochondrial disease community. Uh, of course, we, we hope that there are some TK2 uh, deficiency patients that are diagnosed as well and can participate in the clinical trials so we can find out about the safety and efficacy of the drug that you're developing. Uh, but it's really a, a, you know, a larger vision to it. And again, thank you to Zogenix for your uh, support and, and willingness to, to, to partner on a project like this. Uh, so, uh, Sean, now we really turn to the, the blocking and tackling the logistics, right, of how do we get to it, right? So we know the problem. We know what we want to accomplish. 
Uh, you know, Gene DX was sort of front of mind as we were thinking about a program because of the long history between the mitochondrial disease community and, and Gene DX. Maybe just share briefly uh, with our audience, if you will, the breadth of offering of a company like Gene DX and why you're a good partner to take on a, a project like this. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Um, first of all, Doreen, thanks for, for sharing your story. Those, uh, it's, it's really good to hear that, you know, in the, in the diagnostic space, it's, it's very important for us to think about patients as individuals and, and their stories and not necessarily as a sample um, yeah. that comes in the door. So, so I definitely appreciate hearing it. It's, it's those kinds of stories that, uh, yeah, that, that actually make us enjoy coming to work every day and, mm -hmm. and doing what we do. Um, so, yeah, so, so we, we, as well as others have been, have been doing mitochondrial testing using molecular techniques for, for quite some time. Um, it's, it's arguably one of the more tricky scenarios to deal with on a, on a diagnostic basis. Um, some of that is because of the, the variable presentation that, that patients with different mitochondrial conditions or even the same mitochondrial condition um, have. And, and it's, not just, it's not just like pure mitochondrial disorders, it's also patients with any kind of energy metabolism issues. Um, it, it's, it's across the board, so I'm a, I'm a biochemical geneticist also, as well as a molecular geneticist. And whether it's molecular techniques or using small molecule testing, biochemical genetic techniques, um, mitochondrial disease is, uh, is, is probably the trickiest group of conditions to diagnose um, from the lab standpoint and from the clinician standpoint. Um, so, so the way we tend to tackle it is, is really by kind of by brute force. So we, we have an approach of looking at, at all of the genes um, and, and focusing on ones that have, that, that have had any indications for an energy metabolism or a mitochondrial phenotype um, mm -hmm. that's in the nuclear genome. So the genome that's in every one of our cells that's uh, inherited by mom and dad um, from mom and dad. And so, but we, we also look at the entire genome um, of the mitochondria and, and it gets, it gets quite tricky there. So, so the mitochondrial genome, which is inherited from, from the mother's lineage, um, it is, it's a completely different genome than, than, you know, the nuclear genome. And, and that means it presents its own challenges. So, so we have things like, um, like heteroplasmy. So, so out of all your mitochondria, oftentimes with mitochondrial conditions, not all of the mitochondria right. have that DNA change. Sometimes it's just in a percentage of the mitochondria. And so, right. you know, what we do is we try to figure out exactly what percent that is. Um, you also described the, the muscle biopsy and the needle biopsy during that you went through. And, and that is, that's a, it's a rough procedure. Um, mitochondrial disease is not necessarily a, an adult onset disease. There's also young children that have mitochondrial disease um, and, and children with very severe clinical indications or even adults with very severe clinical indications and, and doing those biopsies could be very challenging. And so, so we're constantly looking for ways to, to improve the, the process and, and eliminate the need for that. And so, so we have different approaches like like using um, urine. So, so we have the ability to look at mitochondrial um, variants in, in samples that are coming from the urine of mitochondrial patients. And it seems to track really well with what you see in the muscles. And obviously it's a lot less invasive to be doing, uh, you know, to be collecting a urine sample versus a muscle biopsy. And so, so really it's kind of a combination of all those different aspects. Um, so broad, approach to, to testing, um, trying to figure out ways to make the process as minimally invasive as possible for the patients. And then, and then lastly is really just having the expertise to know what to do and how to interpret the findings. So, so it is, it is very, very complicated. Um, so we're, we're a team of geneticists and scientists, and that's who's going through each case. And we have people, we have an entire team that's dedicated just to mitochondrial conditions and, and this team, like that's, that's, that's what they, they eat and breathe. And like that, that's their expertise in every single publication and every piece of information that comes out, 
they're on top of it and know that. And, and by specializing um, and having our staff specialize in different clinical groups, it's allowed us to stay on top of that and yeah. really have that expertise. Well, we certainly appreciate the the range of expertise that Gene DX is going to bring to, to this project. And complexity is the hallmark of mitochondrial disease on so many levels, whether it's genetics or symptoms, uh, really so many uh, you know, uh, components of it. So um, understand that that's a, it's a challenge for, for a company like GeneDX. And uh, the, again, thank you for your contributions there. So you know, Lucas, it kind of turns to you, right? So we've, we've talked a little bit about this program and you know I've described it as patient facing, right? Which for many genetic testing programs is not the case. It's, it's typically ge- uh, clinician facing where it, it's up to a clinician to say, I'm at a point, right? In my diagno- diagnosis where, uh, genetic testing makes sense. Let me order that uh, for uh, the patient. But we know there's so many out there in our community that never get to that point because as Doreen described, they may well be in a lab or, 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 or an office, a doctor's office that's not even thinking about genetics, uh, let alone mitochondrial disease. So uh, maybe you could share with our audience a little bit about the probably genetic approach, which is more patient facing and how we're going to use that approach to try and identify the best candidates to move forward in this program. Yeah, sure. And thank you, everybody, for uh, contributing your stories to the panel. I I always find it fascinating um, to see um, what everybody's working on and in particular to hear patient stories. So uh, in particular, thank you to you, Doreen. Our mission at Probably Genetic is diagnosing 200 million rare genetic disease patients, which we think is about the number of patients that exist on the planet that are ill but don't know why they're ill. Um, And maybe the best way to explain why we are trying to build everything patient-centric or patient-facing is by explaining the founding story a little bit. Um, I went to graduate school at the University of Oxford and I worked on uh, clinical genetics. And I had the great fortune to meet uh, many rare disease patients and work on a lot of different cases. And almost independently of the condition, the story that all diseases share is the diagnostic odyssey. And the, the, as I was mulling over my graduate work and had to deal with a lot of physicians' notes and g- notes from genetic counselors, uh, where you read about all kinds of symptomatic descriptions that patients have, I started thinking about how can we help patients find out earlier in their process what's causing their disease. And also if we have 200 million patients that are undiagnosed, how do you even start to make a dent in that? And the original thinking was, what if we could start mining the physician notes for symptomatic descriptions? And if uh, Doreen's physician notes would have said, uh, you know, you mentioned droopy eyelids, you mentioned muscle weakness, uh, you mentioned blurry vision. What if we knew those three data points and could then figure out, maybe this is somebody who should get a mitochondrial disease test done. And the challenge we ran into is physician notes are really hard to get access to and they're hard to read and all the other things you would imagine. And I was talking to a patient at a conference about this problem or a a mom of a patient. And she said, I know exactly what you mean. Before my daughter got her diagnosis, um, we knew she had bruxism. We knew she had seizures. She was diagnosed with autism. Uh, She had an abnormal gait. And as this mom was rattling off her kid's phenotype, um, it kind of clicked for me and I thought, if we could get this mom early in her diagnostic odyssey to plug those symptomatic descriptions into a website or a tool that can interpret it on her behalf, maybe we don't need the electronic medical record to do this. And that's kind of where the idea for probably genetic came from. So fast forward to today, what we do is we try to build those tools that are uh, patient or parent friendly, where patients can type in, in their own words, what their symptoms are. Um, And then we have algorithms in the background that try to figure out, A, do we think you have a genetic disease? And B, do do we think you match one of these particular tests such as, uh, you know, GeneDx's mitochondrial disease panel, um, and then can help patients wherever they are, um, get access to a genetic test by basically just giving them a button on the the website that they can click on and then the test comes to their home. Yeah, so that was the, the original motivation for the company, kind of how we operate the model right now. And over the course of building this, we've been fortunate to partner with companies like Zogenix who have the flip side of the problem, which is patients have a hard time getting diagnoses and Zogenix has a hard time finding enough patients for trials or for eventually approved treatments. Um, so we've, we've been really fortunate to kind of 
sit in the middle of that and start playing a matchmaker um, to help more patients get answers and also help companies like Sogenix develop more treatments. Yeah, well, I think, as, as you know, that was a, a bit of the aha moment for us all, is that if it works well for TK2 and you can you know, drive a program that direction and you're identifying mitochondrial disease patients right along the way, could we design a program, right, that would allow a broader swath of mitochondrial disease patients to come in, share their symptoms, answer a few questions, We'll, we'll use this algorithm to try and identify the best candidates then to move forward for, for genetic testing. And ultimately our goal, return the results and, and deliver as many diagnoses as possible back to the mitochondrial disease patients. So uh, really Lucas, we're, we're very excited. You know, we're calling this a pilot program because I think if we're, you know, we're, we're all learning, right? And so this is a new approach and by no means is this meant to diminish in any way uh, that very important traditional pathway of clinician facing programs, right? Or, or clinician ordered uh, genetic tests. This is meant to be complementary. In fact, we think there's uh, plenty of room in the UMDF testing program for a suite of approaches. You know, the complexity that Sean spoke to really uh, you know, describes it well. There's very rarely a single solution when it comes to mitochondrial disease. So we're gonna start with this patient-centric approach. And, and what I'm personally most excited about is that hopefully we can help more people like uh, Doreen, uh, that by offering this program through our patient registry and our new patient registry, MitoShare, I, I shared earlier in the day, will be open this summer as well. That's gonna be the starting point for this genetic testing program. So please come sign up to join the registry. It's not live yet, but you can join the waiting list so that you'll be notified as soon as it is open. And this genetic testing program will begin there where you can be assessed whether or not you are a good candidate uh, to participate in this program. There are details still to be shared with you and, and, and communicated, uh, but we wanted to take the opportunity today to describe at a high level what our goals are. And I, I have to thank all of the, the panel members. You did a, a great job of describing your role in it. And you know, much like the, the others, Doreen, it, it begins and it ends with you because you are a model for exactly the kind of mitochondrial disease patient that we want to help. We want to help to shorten that diagnostic journey get you to a diagnosis, improve your clinical care. And hopefully that means you choose to participate in clinical trials to help develop treatments and cures for, uh, for mitochondrial disease too. So uh, thank you. So with that, I think we're gonna have to uh, bring this panel discussion to a close. Thank you again to all the, the panel members. And shortly we'll be back with our last panel of the day, uh, which will uh, focus on infrastructure projects uh, for, for research in the mitochondrial disease ecosystem. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.